Uh, welcome to uh, another in the series of webinars for the Men's Suppression and Suicide Network. Um, I'm delighted about this one today uh, for a, a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is I'm a co-investigator on this grant and it would be great to get an update on the project because I hear it's moving really, really quickly. So that's, uh, that's such a great thing and we've got some uh, performances to talk about and some work that's been going really well. So. Again, just excited to get the update. So I've got three presenters. I was like a tripartite of the wealth of information here today and, and really looking forward to what everyone's got to say. I'll do very brief introductions uh, and allow them the most of the time for these guys to, to kind of share what they've been doing. Uh, George Bellevue, pretty good. That's that was pretty good. Um, uh, is a professor of uh, theatre and drama education at the University of British Columbia. Delighted to have him with us. Here today, Foster Eastman, um, a rare talent, Foster Eastman, uh, a, ter a terrific multimedia artist who works and examines social uh, and cultural in, uh, issues, often shrouded in taboo and stigma. And uh, it was great to work with, with Foster on previous projects as well and, and ongoing projects. Terrific to have you here. Uh, and of course, Marv Westwood. Um, so uh, Marv is a professor in the Department of Counseling Psychology at the University of British Columbia. He's recognised internationally for the development of the Veterans Transition Program. We're talking today about a, a project that was funded by Movember in their innovation grants. Um, and the name of this one was called Men Are Action. So I'll hand it over to Marv to do the introductions and talk to the project. and. Really looking forward to this. Hey, thank you, John. Um, why don't you say that uh, when John referred to the title as man, art, action, the key term there is action in the sense that uh, in my work at the university and some of my colleagues, we find that working with a certain group of men, many groups of men, they prefer to actually uh, get the resources and the help they need more by doing things rather than talking. So when we had this opportunity funded by Movember to develop a project which is high on action, that is doing, and uh, both George and Foster will be talking about it because they are they are the coaches, they are the leaders of this project, uh, where then they work with the men, the men are there for a reason, they have a need to, we call it in our world of work, dropping baggage, telling stories, letting go of some of the but the uh, experiences they carry and a very effective way of doing it is do it in a group and do it with action and now invoke kind of an art form, uh, an art form basis through expressive arts and uh, they will refine that. So I think in the end uh, we've come upon, upon a very good opportunity here for a, a pilot study using military uh, graduates from the Veterans Transition Program to be performing and doing in an art format that has extrapolations for non-military men who we see here at UBC and other communities. They actually are seeking resources and help, but they're more at home doing it through doing. And that's why I like the term uh, man art action because it's very specific to this group of people. So I'd like to actually invite now, uh, if it's okay, start with you, Foster, because you're coaching from the art side, George is from the performance side, and if we do it in that order, because you started in this work some time ago with the mural and the panel, right. so do you want to kick okay. it off there? Sure. Uh, this project is almost a spin-off from a project uh, last year that was called uh, Lest We Forget Canada, and it was a mural, it was a community project that I started, and it was the opportunity for community members to uh, work with veterans to meet them and to learn about their experiences in Afghanistan. And the whole idea was to create a mural representing the 162 vet or soldiers that were killed in Afghanistan and community or um, civilians and to raise awareness about the challenges veterans are facing uh, who come home and pay owner and tribute to those that were lost. But it was also to raise money. It was a fundraiser so uh, we could help uh, pay for veterans to take the veterans transition programs. So it was a wonderful opportunity to align with an organization that actually offers such a great service that is and has proved to be very successful for veterans. So it, that uh, was uh, about um, 
organizing evenings and they were quite social evenings, kind of a beer and pizza night with different community members in different uh, net parts of town, what shall we say. And uh, I would take little smaller communities and then they would meet up with veterans and we would work together, almost like the AIDS quilt in the 80s and 90s. And during that process, and I kept the pro, uh, it was an image transfer technique um, to recognize uh, the survivors of war. So it was about the veterans returning with their physical injuries, mental injuries, uh, occupational stress injuries. And uh, it ended up being very interesting way for veterans to tell their stories through the questions being asked by the community. So we would meet two or three times a week, be different veterans, um, but uh, well, we had a consistent group of veterans that would come, but it was different community members. So they were constantly asking questions, and they would be sometimes the easiest, simplest questions on how do you go to the bathroom, and, and they would have to explain what a wag bag is uh, <laughs> when they're not on their, um, I would say campus, but <laughs> what is it, their, uh, where they reside in, in Kabul? Base. Their base. Their base, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Marriage. so uh, when they were out for a tour for the the day, you know, how do they eat? What is the what does their lunch look look like? And so they would ask the simple questions on day to day, as well as complex, like pretty heavy questions that kind of worried me a little bit. But through that process, um, the veterans became spokespeople and uh, leaders of the program or the project, and they ended up and being. Um, media darlings in a way because the media loved this project we got lots of attention and so uh, the veterans would represent the mural across canada with true patriot love at tribute dinners um, they met the prime minister at national day of honor because of this project um, and they met you know general rick hillier who's retired now but it was an amazing opportunity for these young men to become ambassadors from this project so because of that um and actually we're working on canada house right now so that would be wonderful and uh, eventually the mural will find its final home at the canadian war museum so we kind of hit a home run with that project i feel it was really uh, rewarding for everyone not just the veterans but community members because you know um i was inspired from my own lack of understanding of what was going on. And uh, as a citizen, you feel really um, helpless uh, that you can't do anything to help. And when we were having so many young men who were taking their own lives, it was an opportunity to say, yes, we can do something as a community, and this is one thing that we can do. So the tribute poll is to rep replicate that, or that's what I was trying to do is replicate that. And uh, so the idea was to explore alternative methods of healing. So the idea with the tribute poll was to hook up or team up veterans with a First Nations carver and explore the uh, culture and ideology behind First Nations and their healing process. And so uh, a, the tribute poll seemed like a perfect fit because most totem poles in First Nations are either um, commemorative polls or mortuary polls. So this seemed like, well, this is perfect. This is exactly what we're talking about. So, we'll, but we'll call it a tribute poll. And so the idea was to transition or transform something into something quite beautiful and to tell the soldiers their stories. So we were making this out of coffins or caskets, which sound a bit morbid and they are morbid, but part of the whole idea of totem poles is to take a log or a tree and you fall the tree and then you bring it back to life as a totem pole. So this is very symbolic in what we're trying to do with this uh, project. So the idea is to um, tell the soldiers their stories. So <clears throat> the first thing that we had to do, which I think was very symbolic and, and important for the veterans was preparing the pole. And in First Nations culture, that means limbing the pole and, or the, the tree. In our case, it was about taking a casket and returning it back to a pole. So that meant stripping the high gloss finish off, which really represents military armor and all of their military might, uh, uh, 
as far as wind goes. And, uh, and also removing the cushioning and removing all the insides of the caskets, really referencing the lack of military support when they leave the military. So when they're in the military and they're in Afghanistan, they've got all their weapons, all their military support, and when they come back, it's gone. Um, sometimes completely gone if they've retired, and sometimes they're in reservists, and sometimes they're still in, but they're still kind of on their own. They're back with their families, they're back going to school, or you know, they're trying to carry on and, and transition into more of a, what their life used to be. So preparing the poll is very symbolic, and what was interesting, a nice part of that was our master carver, Wallachton, um, performed a healing song. And I did notice that it was quite emotional for the veterans just to um, sit through that, uh, to experience that. Mm -hmm. That was quite emotional. Um, and so we prepared the poll and we removed it. So now we begin with just raw wood, or just a naked state. So the because of the poll, um, we, we can actually tell three stories. Uh, so the fr front of this poll is to tell the stories, story of the soldiers preparing and going to war. And so what we've done is um, transferred uh, satellite imagery of Kabul and Kandahar onto the caskets, which are now uh, just wood. And then what we've carved into that is military ranks, and that's to represent the military family. And then on top of that, we'll be transferring images of uh, a soldier in his full combat, ready for war. This is what he's been working hard to be prepared to do. So that front of it's gonna tell that story. On the back side of the poll, when it's raised, we're able to tell a different story, the story of what their life is like and the challenges that they face now that they're back in Canada. So we have transferred images uh, for the map of Canada on the back of the caskets, and then we're carving all the names of the soldiers who were killed in Afghanistan. And that really is to represent the commemorative bracelets that a lot of soldiers wear to acknowledge their buddies they lost, and also is to represent tattoos. So a lot of soldiers will have their buddies tattooed on their arms or part of their body. So we wanted to reference that. And then of course the image that we want to uh, portray will be an image that represents isolation or depression or post-traumatic stress disorders, um, one of those emotions that many of them feel. So that's the idea on the back. And then because of the casket opportunity, we're able to deposit into the casket during the raising the pole ceremony, anything that will commemorate or acknowledge their experiences while in Afghanistan. So that could be baggage, it could be the horrors, it could be commemorating or acknowledging or recognizing their body. It could be anything that they want. But ideally, what would be nice if it was a sampling of their experiences. This is a soldier's story and this is what happened while we were in Afghanistan. And this will become a time capsule, so in 100 years or 50 years, hopefully, uh, somebody will exhibit it for that long. It can be referenced as a sampling of this is what happened to our soldiers in Afghanistan in 2001 to 2013. So I think that's a pretty interesting option to do that. So my observations from these two projects, working with the community on the mural and working with the veterans, um, with the uh, poll. Um, to be honest, I think the mural has, was more successful. Um, I think that uh, there was more opportunity for questions uh, with community members really interested and they actually don't know anything about their experiences. So it opened up an entire expanse, it's, it's, uh, expanse of questions. So the questions were really uh, much more um, interesting and um, open. Uh, participation uh, seemed better uh, with the veterans, uh, probably because I organized a lot of the community members to come, so there was more of an obligation for the veterans to come because they knew there were going to be people there, so there was more of a commitment. Um, they also became team leaders of the project and became very proud of the project and became the experts and the leaders. And then 
moved on to becoming the spokespeople uh, for the mural in Toronto and across Canada. It also seemed to work better for recruiting and bringing more veterans on board. Uh, that particular project was an easier teach. And so it was easy to involve people. So the technique was easier and it was just more social, mm -hmm. way more social. So there's always beer or non-alcoholic beer or uh, <laughs> pizza. So it was quite a social thing and I think uh, veterans look forward to it. Um, trivia poll, same experience, to, but just to a less degree. Um, proximity to the project is a big problem. Um, they can't be an hour drive away if it's not working. Uh, so that was a problem. Um, also, the candidates and participants uh, were very, uh, very busy lives. They're at that age where they're having families, they're working. Um, it's hard to get them to commit to more than once a week. So uh, once a week is, is enough um, and with their family. Also, uh, because there was a larger buddy system, I think they relied on their buddies more. And uh, it's like, oh, he'll cover for me, he'll cover for yeah. me. And it ended up that I had nobody covering for nobody. So, <laughs> so that, that didn't work. Um, also, a lot of these had RBTN grads, and I think they were actually pretty, feeling pretty good about themselves, or, or in a pretty good place. And I think their participation had a lot to do with doing it for Marv, because Marv asked them to do it, and they're gonna do anything for Marv. Um, because Mark has made a big impact on his programs on their lives. Um, also, and I was very careful not to have, make anyone feel bad about not participating. So, you know, I want them to come, but I don't want them to feel bad about not coming. So I had to be really careful, and it, it, and some people did feel bad. So, but things happen. Their life happens, and they can't come. And uh, so some we had some dropouts early on because they were feeling bad, and that, that's not what this project was about. So we don't want that. Um, their conversations uh, were really about, have you seen so-and-so, and I haven't seen so-and-so for a while. They didn't really talk about Afghanistan or their experiences in Afghanistan, and I think that's the part that was therapeutic. So just by talking about those stories over and over with the mural, with different community members, uh, I think there was more therapeutic uh, and result than this, these conversations. Um, and then of course, this project is about carving. Uh, there's a bit of a fear factor. Uh, some of the veterans were afraid that they were gonna screw up. And, uh, and that's true, maybe the project, uh, it wasn't that difficult to carve it, uh, more difficult than the other project. Yeah. So something to consider uh, technique and maybe uh, more carving lessons before we bring them on board. As far as the media, they love media. So whenever there's media, they're all there. So I <laughs> and media loves this story. So you know, Georgia Strait is a story. We have lots of stories on the on the mural and CTV National is doing a segment this week. Uh, they filmed it last week. So and all the boys, they all show up for media. So <laughs> maybe I just need to have media there. Every time. there. Yeah. So the next project and the lessons learned would be about recruitment and making sure that those that are wanting to take part in this project are going to commit and that they, they don't live too far away that it's uh, easy for them to cancel. Uh, that's, that's something. Um, the time frame, three months, is a bit tight, quite tight. So uh, it would have to be longer next time, uh, especially if we can only count on them uh, once a week, or it'd have to really make the project much simpler, but I think it defeats the whole purpose of getting to know them. And I think the, the whole process um, need, means getting together. So we need to get together more than four or five times. Um, keep it simple, um, the technique, and perhaps make it a bit more social. The carving, it's intense, and I don't want people screwing up, so maybe I need to lighten it up. So now, there you go. <laughs> Good, I was gonna say, yeah. uh, are there any images there, Andrew, of the poll to date? Because it's quite uh, advanced. Are there any uh, images? Uh, well, on... Um, oh, here, today. Oh, I didn't bring any. No, but just here. Yeah. Any yeah. Uh, okay. No, but if you go on Georgia Strait, Kandahar, yeah. uh, Veterans Kandahar, Georgia Strait, it'll come up, the article, and it'll show some photos of veterans carving and uh, yeah, we're about, we're more than halfway there. So. 
But Foster, because it is you're breaking new uh, ter territory and doing this like you did at the other one, and it's going to be shown as part of the performance event, and there's a videographer working with you, so this could, even though it's a pilot, maybe it wasn't as engaging as the first one. It's quite artistic and powerfully influential. So do you want to comment just lastly about what do you see the video that's being produced, how that would be used from after the performances are all over, like where would you like to see that go? In schools or in uh, in military training or where? Like, this is the yeah. video that's specifically yeah. the it's one that's around the making the, uh, the tribute tribute call. Right. Uh, Any comments about what, how you'd like to see it go? Because well, it's quite a production. Well, Galen's uh, production is different than Blair's. You're talking yes. about Galen's. Yeah. Galen's will be just a short piece. Um, yeah, I think it'd be wonderful to show uh, to to go through the schools and, and because I, I mean I think community members would, are are very interested. That's the one thing I mean that I noticed, and I could have got more community involvement in this project yeah. because the community is interested and they do want to help. Yeah. So, and I think it is therapeutic for everybody. Yes. Well, I think so, the uh, you yeah. talked about the veteran participation group. Yeah. There's a whole public participation right. group. Once this is produced and shown. Mm -hmm. I think it may be very engaging to the public because the artists are veterans and that's unusual and you right. coach them through that. So I look forward to the impact on the society of right. this project, yeah. uh, which I think could be carefully done and quite influential. Well, exactly. And with the mural, um, and even myself, it was depressing watching the news and seeing all these young people die. And I think there's a lot of community out there that would like to talk about that. And the last thing they want to see are young men and women taking their own lives. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a big need and want for a community to get to know veterans and, and or anyone who's uh, struggling with depression. As yes. Well. I mean, it's, and just uh, what you picked up on is the coffin or the casket is the icon in this country. About the they always came home in a wrap ceremony. Right. It's a coffin. That's correct. And it was always stainless steel and kind of, uh, kind of uh, very simple in design. But you've taken that coffin and made them more uh, kind of a tribute to their lives, the carvers and so on. So I'm interested in comparing the usual. An aluminum coffin that we see coming home compared to what you produced. Right. Um, so I just think you've captured an icon for military in the modern day. Coffins come home by aircraft. Right. Whereas this is mm -hmm. coffins are put together, a tribute pole, and it's going to be raised. Right. And I liked your idea about you fill the tree and then you bring it back to life. The goal with these participants, both in George's and my project and yours, is how to come back to life. Uh, uh, because when people serve and they don't get the treatment they need, part of them is dead. Physically, they're alive, but you know from the other project, they came to life in a number of ways. Right. So, and I see this even in the uh, people who are working with you is coming back to life again. Right. So I like the symbol that's yeah, and the reference to the box and, and the reference and to the being, box. Yeah, you know, they're kind of trapped in this box. That's right. So I think right. it's very wrong. That yeah. Way. So I'm interested in the community and public reaction to your project. Great. Yeah. So uh, then, so Foster's just oriented us to the uh, to his project. Another project going on is uh, being led by George uh, Bellovo here at UBC, and George and I got together on this because we thought that the theater, the notion of theater and stage and performance, was very relevant to military. And if you think of language of the military, they talk about the theater war. And military people do perform. They perform a career. And what we've done with George's leadership here is get them to perform new lives back. So they're performing themselves, but performing themselves in a new way. And, uh, you know, film, performance, theater, people feel safe going and watching on stage. I don't have to go and say much, but I can vicariously identify with the story and what I think I want to say. And I'm getting feedback from people saying, these actors are actually soldiers. We've never seen a production like this. And these actors are performing their own story. It's extremely unusual. So why don't you pick it up from there, George, about uh, your role and what you've done with your team. Okay, because performing self is what we started with, right? Mm -hmm. First of all, I acknowledge, um, I think, Foster's uh, description of the project, because there's many, many resonances to both projects. and. 
I think when you were describing the the journey from last year and then the journey this year and and then also the the choice of involving community and soldiers and um, the the metaphors and the links to the the coffins and the pole and the First Nations healing all of those things I think have influenced the theater project because we have been working in uh, Foster's studio throughout throughout the process up to now and that's been a gift from Foster um, he keeps on giving in different ways but it's been a larger gift than the physical uh, because yeah. it's the, the the stories maybe that the when they're carving that are not being told we're witnessing the carving every time and Foster and others there so we are there is a conversation about that happening either directly or indirectly with the soldiers that um, that are working on the theater piece which for, for us there's been four consistent soldiers and uh, and like in foster's project we've had other people come in and out but uh, we have four committed and probably another six other very committed community members along with uh, marvin myself so so that um but it, it is the conversation does come out sometimes of, of the poll and what does it mean the names the, the the band that foster referred to that some of the soldiers wear dale one of our um, individuals and then who's linking both projects does wear his band and we've actually created a a monologue that brings in this notion of the band of brothers so um so let me just maybe i'll, I'll spend a few minutes talking about trying to source out what we were going to do with the theater piece um, I'm not an expert in um, the, the Veterans Transition Network. I've, I've gone to different functions, and so I know a little bit about it, but I, I never want to pretend that the content and their stories uh, that I was really that knowledgeable about. So it's, it's been a learning experience in terms of the content. Um, what I felt more comfortable with was using a particular methodology or an approach to activate or um, uh, bring to life the, their stories. And I did not begin this project with a mission saying this is where this is where I'm going. Um, I do traditional theater where we're mounting this play for this audience. This one I really wanted for us to have an exploration period. And um, in our world, three four months is a, is a good amount of time. Usually I only have one month, so this was so I had a <laughs> I had a month or so to kind of explore the ideas with them and also test their the, the waters in terms of how comfortable they would be to to not only tell their stories, but to embody their stories. A little different uh, sitting around talking about things and then getting up and really erasing a lot of the words and allowing your, your, your body to tell the story. They jumped right in. Um, there was no hesitation, the, the individuals that we were working with. So I knew that we could push it a little bit further and um, to use more of a theatrical language than completely narrative. So the first, I would say, four or five sessions, we did explore the, um, through drama-based activities, what could we draw out of their stories so that each individual, we had a chance that what did they want to put forward on the table, and um, then so we could take that information and then our, our research, our um, artistic team could then craft the script. So that, that exploration period was, um, w was rich for us in, in kind of knowing the content, getting feedback again from everyone involved. Um, so now we've, we've jumped into the scripting period and the rehearsing period, which becomes a little more exciting because there's a so-called product, but it's still porous in the sense that the what we put forth as a skeleton frame was able to, to keep weaving it. But then we, we made some uh, decisions in terms of title, um, contact, unload. Again, that came through through rehearsals that everything was trying to come out of the group, emerging out of the group, as opposed to being imposed by us. Um, the um, you you go backwards a little bit when the script is created because everyone now is reading a script and, and there's there's a, a sense of being frozen in um, in trying to get it right versus before we were just exploring and improvising. Um, however, because that frozen script is really emerged out of them, many of them are playing themselves, which sometimes is comfortable, and for others it's. Um, it's a re it's a revisiting of a particular moment in their lives which again the therapeutic enactment work that Marv has done has brought them through that process but now they're being witnessed by other people and um, they are also in a, a different setting a different frame so there's there's fragility happening we're very um, conscious of that and there's always um, 
someone from the counseling team at every rehearsal because there is um, there is triggering happening when we're doing that. Anyway, coming back to the script, though, the the, the script is a, it's a long process in in terms of trying to have it's like any other research you have hundreds of pages of data on why you're going to choose that particular that line that particular moment and um, and less is more and trying to use techniques that we can like Mar um, uh, Foster was referring to that like what what types of approaches in theater are more amenable to let's say people with less experience so that's always running through your head I'm very conscious that we have a very large team and we want to involve them in all capacities so um, I'm finding myself often in this project making sure that people have ownership and leadership while trying to maintain that because it's it's not about my vision it's about everyone's vision but in order for everyone to keep buying into it they need to have this, um, element or moments of power to either in the script or in the directing or in the acting and, and it comes up at all times and it's very um, communicative I'll always get someone saying something during lunchtime saying how about this and you try to listen to it carefully and, and bring it in so it's been a very collaborative in the best sense of co-labor of the of, of the work in terms of the artistic and the uh, the doing and talking about doing it is about doing we try to get up on our feet and and do and and that's again coming from a university perspective where you know, we are a place of mind in terms of usually it's um you know, all up here, and then so to, to go down there into the body and then and move, and is we, we do have to get up off the chairs. So that's been um, it, it's always a conscious thing because it's you do we do have about six or seven people from the university involved in different capacities. So um, the action has been very very necessary. Um, moving towards the rehearsal phase, the phase that we're in right now, and then moving towards production. There, there is a sense of, um, I wouldn't say apprehension, but there is going to be a public. Um, these stories are, they're, they've been written down, they've been uh, put into visual art pieces, but there's going to be something else when they are actually physically telling these stories and they are their stories. So there's going to be a, a, a time right now that we have to be very mindful that there's going to, we have to put, um, checks in place in order for everyone to to be able to be as um, comfortable doing that and as effective so slowly and but surely we're, we're trying to give um, suggestions to certain certain members that how, how can you do that without um, freezing because as soon as you have a hundred people in front of you all of a sudden things change it's no longer in the rehearsal hall so we will have to gradually bring people to rehearsals with one one technique. We're going to have to um, make sure that they know it so well that even though that they're on automatic pilot and they're really nervous, they they can still it's still going to come out. The co actors are going to have to be very helpful to their uh, to their peers, and um, we might have there might be some of the actors are going to have to hold on to their script because it's sort of like the um, uh, and it's not demeaning, but it's like the, the, the blanket that the six, seven, eight, nine-year-old child just can't let go because it's it's comfort. And um, so we'll reach the, as far as we can go with the production. But at the end, we're not um, we're not heading to Broadway with this. The idea was the the, the doing in the process, as uh, Foster described, and then hopefully the mobilizing of this. Um, understanding of their stories and, and that's going to happen through the, the videos that are created the documentaries uh, events like this and uh, the public that's going to see it so that part is very important but it's been all about the whole process all along the way and um, reaching towards that side maybe I'll stop there I thought you might uh, we might add in something uh, here at the end of each performance each evening's performance the audience is those that have to leave will leave, but others are invited to stay back. And there is focused discussion groups that are co-facilitated with a group facilitated from UBC in our program in counseling psychology, so with group expertise. Plus, uh, the veterans themselves will be in the group as resource people because they've been acting on the stage. And other veterans will be coming and helping out each evening who have been through the VTP to explain to the public these invisible wounds that they saw performed on the stage. So it's going to be quite a dynamic post-group, uh, kind of a developmental group. 
as well. So that's a uh, that's really exciting for us to think about getting the public to interact with what they've seen performed on the stage. And that's where family awareness uh, foster. Some people will come to the show because they have a brother or an uncle or somebody who's struggling, isolated in a basement or maybe into addictions and at risk. And they'll say, why don't you come see the show? And then at the end, when they meet the other veterans who've been to the program, they'll see them as allies and they probably will say, uh, what's that program about? Can you talk to me about it? How do I get involved in it? So it's a way of recruiting uh, men into uh, a program if they still have a kind of psychotherapeutic work to do. Uh, I think the public uh, will also be drawn to it because, you, George, you didn't mention, I think, but you were very uh, clear on this, that half the performers are civilians mm -hmm. they, with, the other, with the veterans. So they teach each other about being in the military and to teach each other about being a performer on stage. And they're now becoming like one group. They're, the distinctions are slowly moving away. They have more in common than different, uh, difference, I think, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that, and that happens in a lot of the, the rehearsals. We, we start seeing some of the, the military explaining how to, it's, it's not, uh, 001, it's zero, zero, 001, and uh, so they, the, the, um, the military language is being taught by the military to the civilians. Um, I think there's less maybe teaching going the other way, but I think they, they do, the military are looking to the others as, um, as, as people for some acting tips, because we do have a couple of people in the, in the troop that are actors. And the story, I'll just, last thing I would say, the stories in the in the production are very gripping because they're real life stories. And I think anybody in the audience watching it uh, would see that, oh, okay, so one way you can drop the baggage is by uh, going to see this play and you can identify that could be my story. But, you know, and it's kind of be, there's a lot of grieving that will go on uh, through the performance of the people in the audience because they're very candid about what they had to drop when they came back. And the story also has a hopeful, uh, the script is a very hopeful part at the end, is from their own voices, what they did to get their lives back is referred to in the play. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, like you said, there's a dark side to the show, and there's also an upside of how there's life after and how they can access through Movember. Uh, in projects, the one that John and Mary May have put on websites, that's all going to be there, because a lot of the audience will be non-military, and they say, okay, how do I get into this? So it's part of the November mandate. How do you activate and get people to come in into psychological health services? Um, I'm very excited about that. I was just going to add in terms of the, the, the narrative, because when, when Foster talked about on one side of the pool, there's a particular narrative of pre-going yeah. to war and, and then some of those images and on the, uh, on the other side as well. That, I mean, indirectly or directly influenced the, the way the script is being developed. The, the typical script in, in these... Um, uh, projects would have been an episodic one. You would have had ten vignettes, like two stories from each of them, and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because it becomes a pastiche mm -hmm. when you put together. Um, we had the luxury of having Graham Lee work with us, who really has been working through a lot of these projects in the past. So we wanted to take it a little bit further to have a, a narrative thrust. So we have two narrative thrusts throughout it, and it is a story of of, of hope of, of one individual that that keeps pushing back help um, and then towards the end we we do we do bring that narrative not to a, um, a rose colored that everything is glossy and everything is, is fine but we do bring them into the space of, of Marv's decades of work and into a therapeutic enactment where this individual does come forward and you do see that there is hope and which as Marv said that then leads towards the end of the play which we hope that the audience will then see that, okay, if, that there was a resistance to get there, but once someone is there seeking help, there are alternatives to, to uh, some of the, the unfortunate alternatives that some of the, our returning soldiers have taken. There are better alternatives than that in terms of uh, coming back to life so that the discussion then follows through. So that thread of one story, and then we used, um, we used a Shakespeare thread as well throughout it so that we can also bring, which is one of Henry V's uh, powerful speeches about getting everyone revved up for war and uh, but what's inside that war is what we discover and mm -hmm. these men that go to these wars what are the the wounds that that you can't see so those two threads come together as we unfold 
their stories within it. But I think that was important, an important decision for us, for the audience to take them through the, we're so accustomed, we're such a televisual and movie world that we always want a narrative. The episodic becomes um, uh, less investment in terms of the feeling of it. But we'll see if we can achieve that. It's it's in the script. It's now in the hands of the artistic team to try to bring that forward. Right. That's it. Um, so we'll definitely open it up uh, to questions for any of our remote viewers. And you can either log in to Google Plus and just post your questions in the chat box, or you can also email. Um, and the email address is merrily.hughes, spelled M E R R I L E E dot Hughes, H uh, U G H E S, at nursing.ubc.ca. Um, so there's a little bit of a lag time with the streaming video, so I just thought while we're waiting to see if anybody else uh, wants to post a question, I had a quick question for you myself, and, and that was about the title. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You said, I, my sense was that there was a little bit of discussion about, yeah, about the backstory. title, and, uh, and you uh, selected con contact on load, mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that, that yeah. title choice. Well, the back to life, as it, we, we, we heard it in different ways, was, was our working title. And uh, we, we always felt that it was almost, it was too, too direct. And then No One Comes Back With Wounds was another title. And again, they were lines or in the play. Um, one of the, in rehearsals, uh, we, we were doing a particular scene where it was an, a very action scene with uh, one of our actors, Chuck. And, and then they kept yelling, contact, contact. And then uh, reload, reload, and then so we that that really resonated. And we had a reading of a pre-script at, at my home maybe two and a half weeks ago, and we spent a lot of time talking about titles. And um, but so contact was there for for a while. We liked the idea that because we're trying to reach contact, we're trying to contact other people. It's a, a very military word, but it was also that there was the, the contact with one another. There was so that one was quite. But we didn't know what the second half would be. <laughs> and um, of course, Marvin mentioned in this uh, webinar in terms of the unloading the baggage and then dropping the baggage. So the unloading, and then some of the, uh, the military really like the oxymoron of the contact unload. Like if you're in contact, you would definitely not unload, you'd be loading. Um, so the unload had, had quite a bit of um, nuance to it. And um, we want to move away from the academic contact semicolon unload, which uh, every other paper that you will see usually has that uh, <laughs> that descriptor. So the um, the exclamation mark plays with that nuance as well. So many people, but it came from the veterans. Really, it was them coming forward, and I, I was I was I was patient to wait for that title from them, and Graham as well. And uh, of course, we consulted other people to make sure we were not offending. Um, I had a question too. Um, so the, the, uh, both these people have helped put the pitch together for November, Marilee and, I know. and Andrew. Yeah. Did a lot of, yes. a lot of the, a lot of the work around putting that video together and stuff. And um, uh, so it's a bit of a question for everyone, you know, about you know the when you usually it's a big written kind of piece that you put forward for a proposal, and this one was very different. So I, I wonder. Uh, everyone would have seen the pitch, the five-minute pitch video, and just how does it feel after? Because, you know, when we write a, a script, so to speak, about a grant proposal, we kind of, like, know exactly what we're going to do or we have promise, promisable yeah. deliverables. This seems like it's a bit different. So I'm just interested to, to casting your mind back to the trailer, yeah. as it were, or the pitch, whether, you know, whether it's... Uh, how much it's moved or how, how the process felt. Because it's a very unusual way of doing business yeah. in traditional academic world, you know, to put a video forward and get some money to do mm -hmm. a project. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just going to comment because I think it was you, John, that, uh, or both you and Mary Lee that got our attention and said there's a call for a proposal. And I think you were the one that said, why don't we go put in and let's go for it. Uh, and I think they were calling for a proposal that had in terms of learning and change was disruptive and unusual, or something used the word, and I was drawn to that right away. Uh, what I think happened, because the pitch was they trusted us enough to give the voices of the uh, participants, so 
they're coming forward and they are actually the script writers and the developers of the project. They have a large ownership and that would never have been possible if we had had the normal constraints on a proposal. So I thought they just opened up a great creative possibility uh, that the voices and the artistic representations of self came through wonderfully. So I'm very, I just think it's a privilege to be part of this. That's my first reaction because it was a disruptive. And it, it will be disruptive if you come on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, disruptive of your ideas about heroic people coming home. In the most positive sense, disruptive, disrupt your thinking. Well, when when also when you're asked to do this this video, and I, and I do remember that thinking, whoa, what a challenge because you had really we you were you know a certain world, and then to try to pick out what Marv and I were thinking at that time, which we were still we knew we knew not really exactly what we were thinking, but I think what the resonance for me was that. The uh, grant proposal forced us to use a language that was um, performative in itself by doing the yeah. interview. So you, you had to select, okay, what is it that's going to speak to the to that audience of, of, of uh, assessors? And I think that's what we're doing also. We're having to choose a more performative language, the, the, the narratives that we're using. Um, I talk about this quite often with my grad students who, who do arts-based research, uh, is that what the language that you use artistically is different from the academic one, but it has to speak to one another. So it's never fully distant, but it is, it's an economy of words. Um, it's, um, it's whittling down, it's, the, it's, it's polishing everything. And so I think in that process, both of you had to try in five minutes you didn't have time to do all that narrative eight-page eight massaging, so it's. I think more grants should be um, this, yeah. going that way because it forces us to speak in a different language, and another register. And it's just wonderful to have that opportunity to be creative without having constraints. Being straight jacket. Yeah, yeah we and I think that's the whole idea is to to do that is to see what else is out there. And, uh, I think it's some people are going to be quite shocked with what we've created. Mm -hmm. In a good way. I think <laughs> as a result of it, uh, taking, I use the word, we weren't straightjacketed, nor were the veterans straightjacketed. So all the therapeutic community that comes to see the production will see what people want when they go for help from those groups in ways they'll never have seen in a journal ever before. Because they're, not, they, they pride themselves in being very honest, gut wrenchingly honest about what helps and what doesn't help in our profession. And they say it, and so I'm really interested in the therapeutic community that comes and watches, whether it's medicine or nursing or psychology or psychiatry. They're going to be, it's going to be disruptive about their beliefs about what is most helpful in the best of ways. And I think art form, to go back to that, and performance brings us into mainstream society. The art forms and theater performance are part of a normal everyday society. But So we've infiltrated those uh, those kind of uh, forms in a way that's never been uh, accessed before. And, and it engages the community more. I bet it Absolutely. does. Yeah. a really comfortable way yeah. to engage yeah. and to talk about it at the dinner table. Yeah. That's right. I remember um, putting together a Peter Wall grant with some colleagues and then trying to defend the notion uh, of uh, what we call research-based theater or research-based art where you perform your, your data and uh, and it was kind of going back and forth well you know how is it credible you know how can we, we uh, check and uh, will it be assessed will can you can't put that into a, an academic journal and then uh, we had a whole bunch of responses yes we can there's different ways of doing it but I remember one of the theater props here um, Stephen Heatley said he said afterwards, he said, do you think, like he said, let's say a piece, and we were talking about another piece I was doing at the time, and there was going to be maybe 80 people for about four nights, so it was going to be about 300 people seeing it. And he said, uh, do you ever, and he was being a little cynical, he said, did you ever get a, a journal article where you think there were like 300 people who A, read it, and B, were completely absorbed with it, and then C, were like not only absorbed, but moved by it, and then were activated for change and actually and right. um, there is space in this this piece to talk afterwards and and I said probably not but uh, that not not in the articles that I've written that there have been that so it's, it's just changing our mindset 
And uh, because to do a well done article as well, it's like whatever, I don't know how many hours we're putting with this production, you know, in the hundreds of hours, but a good written journal article is also, so they're not, it's not one against the other, it's just a different modality. And plus just to uh, make note that uh, the article on Georgia Strait has been shared over 477 times in one week. Wow, oh, that's amazing. So the spin-offs. Yeah. So yes, I have fresh. a I have a question, and it's um, from Ivy Lim Carter, who's uh, a colleague uh, actually based in November, um, and so she's actually speaking as someone who's who's seen the application process quite directly, and that there was a focus about um, using the positive elements of masculinity to engage men in changing uh, behavior, and so she's just wondering that hasn't really come up in the discussion yet, and. Um, and and how kind of uh, using positive elements right. of masculinity um, plays a role in, in I would like to address that um, for ID. It's uh, going to be featured as part of the intro to the performance or the closing. Is the positive thing about masculinity and getting healthy again is one of the high values for many men in their socialization is to help others. That's a primary value. Uh, to be to be protective and to be helpful to others. So what we use in this process is they help themselves by helping others. And they're part of a team, part of a group, and many men understand working together in groups, whether it comes from sport or whether it comes from uh, social groups or even gangs, like when you can work with the gangs. Uh, if you know how to work with them with your lessons, you can actually turn it around that they can actually rehabilitate because they help one another. So I think that's one of the highest values that I prize from BTP. The therapeutic value, and people know our depression rates are dropping, so the risk of suicide is dropping, self-esteem is increasing because they are pulling together and helping one another rather than being individualistic or relying on psychotropic drugs for recovery. And that's actually one of the reasons I chose carving. Because it, I mean, I hate to say it sounds sexist, but it's a very manly trade. Uh, actually, I don't even, yeah. I've studied a lot of uh, First Nations carvers and I haven't even come across one uh, female woman uh, no. carver. So it is a very manly trade and also working with tools yeah. does help engage conversation. And that definitely happened through, yeah. through just working with tools. Yes. Yeah. So Ivy also had a, a question specifically for you, Foster, about um, you spoke about images identifying uh, or signifying isolation, for example, from PTSD. Mm -hmm. And so she was curious, what are the I ideas of what these images would look like? Well, <laughs> it's going to be one of our soldiers curled up in a ball and naked in the fetal position on the back of the box, like he's trapped in this box. It'd be the same soldier who's represented in the front in 14 feet tall at full military gear. So I think that the contrast is going to be very moving. And it'll be well represented. And we hope Ivy can attend one of those three evenings. Uh, an invitation, an informal invitation was sent, and a formal invitation will be coming forthcoming, and she can see that. We'd like her to see this. Uh, and there's also a, a question specifically for George, and that's um, uh, the, at the performances, you talked about there being a professional counselor uh, mm -hmm. in the rehearsals. I'm just wondering about whether there would be one at the public performances in case the so, performance triggers emotions mm -hmm. for even members in the audience or exactly. uh, whether there's information uh, mm -hmm. where to get help. That's a good question and a very uh, some, something that we, we pay attention to. There'll be, we, we hope to have at least four um, because we'll, we'll probably divide in subgroups because we're not going to do the post discussion as a uh, one one big uh, small group. Yeah. It'll be small groups again to represent the spirit of the, the work that Myers has been doing and others in group. So we'll have probably a minimum of four yeah. on each evening. Plus, as I may know, is the ethics because this is a research project. The ethics requires that when you have a public performance like this with people uh, who could be triggered in PTSD in each of the groups, there's at least two. Um, therapists in, uh, from UBC joining the soldiers for precisely that reason. And what I'm glad about, you often go to movies or theater performances of harsh stuff and there's no one to debrief with them. And so we have referral uh, resources there made available to families, to people who uh, are activated or want to, go, want to be able to get connected to counseling. 
it's a perfect way and military people so i'm glad she's raised that but absolutely uh, not only in rehearsals but the night of the performances and we're also following up with uh, the actors uh, for three weeks post performance absolutely that's why i like that uh, cleared ethics and we're we're following through with that also there it, it is the journal article will come out it will be published because there's two forms of methodology one is qualitative and quantitative there are pre and post measures of, for for individual change we're monitoring plus there's going to be in-depth interviewing and content and uh, phenomenological analysis of the experience the change experience of the actors and so we're very interested in that as well and then we'll publish it Oh, I want to give credit also to our colleagues in Flinders University in Queensland, Australia, uh, Michael Balfour and Linda uh, Hassel. Who, Hassel. They they created the play called The Difficult Return, and it's an inspiration for my work. Well, we worked together with them in uh, Flinders University, and they generously contributed a part to our script. So mm -hmm. we're, we're really thankful for that. Yeah, Griffith University, they're at. All right, I think that's the last of the questions okay. we have. Um, but I wondered if we wanted to highlight the upcoming performance and yeah. opportunity to um, see the, the uh, tribute poll, um, which is on April 30th, May 1st, and May 2nd at the Granville Island uh, Studio 1398. Uh, that's here in Vancouver. 7.30 p.m. 7.30 p.m. to come see the performance contact unload and the tribute poll. Yes, I think we'll part be there of the as show. Well. No, that's right. and, uh, I don't know if Are tickets available, available now? Not available yet on Eventbrite. But if they're not available They're yet. due to come out tomorrow, from right. what I understand. Okay. Right. So the tickets will get released tomorrow. And um, and, I, and I guess uh, the other the other bit is, is that uh, I know Peter Wall are very interested in bringing it to UBC and we hope to have yeah. uh, confirmation of a date in the oh, fall, right. um, you know, by the time these air at Grand oh. So I think that's I think that's terrific as well to be able to bring bring it to UBC. Uh, For about a thousand people. About a thousand <laughs> people, that's right. That's how many are going to want to come. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it'd be I think it'd be really something. So um, yeah, it's been great. I, I guess um, my job is just to say thank you. Yep. So thank you, oh. and uh, great to, great to have you guys. So looking forward to this. And uh, so looking to, to um, looking forward to see it continue as well. I think yes. there's lots of ways we can catalyze this one. Yeah. Definitely. So thank okay. you again. Thank you.